Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Now, what we have been doing that uh, as we have already discussed, indeed scientific practices are not exhausted in terms of our puzzle solving activities, day to day research activities or through norm bound science, normal science, okay? science which is guided by only day to day research activities. Okay? That is why we have already discussed if, if normal science is the tradition bound activity, then revolutionary science is the tradition shattering activity. Okay? That is why when a paradigm fails to promote fruitful, interesting and smooth normal science, okay, it is considered to be in a crisis. The depending of the crisis leads to the replacement of the existing paradigm by a new one then we must go ahead with a new paradigm and this replacement is called scientific revolutions that is why uh, as we just now said that uh, no uh, uh, normal science is a tradition bound activity whereas revolutionary science is a tradition shattering complement to the tradition bound activity of normal science and thus once a science enters the paradigmatic stage, stage of model, model of inquiry, paradigmatic inquiry, okay, it is characterized by mm, first normal science and then revolutionary science. And in sheer temporal terms, normal science occupies much larger space than Dutch revolutionary science. Revolutionary science may occur once a while but you will find more often than not okay, non-revolutionary or norm bound or normal science. That is why, uh, that is to say uh, science is revolutionary once a while and mostly it is non-revolutionary or normal in character. Also the scientific character activity engaged in by most of the practitioners can be characterized aptly in terms of normal science. Because of this temporal and numerical magnitude, okay, try to understand this. We can say that much of the scientific activity as we ordinarily encounter is normal, though this normal course is occasionally interrupted by revolutions which change the form, content and direction of the process of the scientific community which is basically normal by which we mean a non-revolutionary committed activity uh, by which we mean a tradition bound activity. Okay? From here onward what we are going to do, we are trying to delineate different stages. We started with pre-paradigmatic stage, paradigmatic stage, normal science and now how we are going to uh, have uh, crisis through anomalies okay? uh, and then it will be uh, uh, followed by I mean normal science anomalies crisis and then we will encounter a new paradigm mediated by revolutionary science, scientific revolution. Normal science demands a thorough going convergent thinking okay? because normal science is practiced in the context of a paradigm. That is why in the pre-paradigmatic stage as we had witnessed divergent thinking in the case of um, creative areas like uh, uh, art, literature, music, philosophy, even medicine. Okay. But 
but within a paradigm within the paradigmatic stage normal science demands a thorough going convergent thinking and hence is preceded by an education that involves a dogmatic initiation in a pre established tradition that the student is not equipped to evaluate normal science is an activity that purports not to question the existing paradigm because of the convergence in thinking but to increase the precision i'm quoting from kuhn's the structure of scientific revolutions of 1962 where kuhn suggests that normal science is an activity that purports not to interrogate the existing paradigm but to increase the precision of the existing theory by attempting to adjust existing theory or existing observation in order to bring the two into closer and closer agreement first secondly normal science is an activity that purports not to interrogate the existing paradigm but to extend the existing theory to areas that it is expected to cover but in which it has never before been tried in other words normal science consists in solving puzzles that are encountered in forcing nature into the conceptual boxes supplied by the reigning paradigm by the paradigm which rules the roost by the existing paradigm it is in this way kuhn attempts to account for the smooth defined and directional character of day to day scientific uh, research in terms of the features of what he calls normal science and normal science has no room for any radical thinking because radical thinking is is the hallmark of uh, uh, scientific revolution uh, i mean revolutionary science whereas uh, normal science has no room for any radical thinking and normal science also is limited to the uh, enterprise of solving certain puzzles in accordance with the rules specified by the existing paradigm existing model and these rules these rules of the existing paradigm are never interrogated but only accepted and followed that's why prior to prior to einstein or prior to copernicus for example in astronomy ptolemy's claims in astronomy were never questioned but only accepted and followed and the aim of scientific education is to ensure that that the paradigm is internalized by a student now we do we do not want to question the existing paradigm the only thing is that we need to internalize the existing paradigm in other words the professional training in science consists in accepting the paradigm as given and equipping oneself to promote the cause of the paradigm by giving it greater precision and further elaboration and the day to day scientific research does not aim at anything fundamentally new but only at the application of what has already been given namely the theoretical ideas and the practical guidelines for solving certain puzzles it is in this sense that normal science is not a revolutionary science no it is not a part of revolutionary science it is highly a tradition bound activity it is it never questions na uh, the uh, existing paradigm okay however it is this normal science it is this tradition bound activity which makes science a successful enterprise kun says that normal science the puzzle solving activity is a highly accumulative enterprise eminently successful in its aim the steady extension of the scope and precision of scientific knowledge in all these respects it fits with i mean normal science fits with great precision the most usual image of scientific works yet one standard product of the scientific enterprise is missing that is normal science does not aim at novelties of fact or theory and when successful finds none okay i mean normal science always follows the pattern of uh the tradition the pattern of the existing paradigms does not aim at 
novelties of fact or theory. Okay? In order to reconcile the, the undeniable fact of novelty that science exhibits according to Kuhn by making new discoveries with somewhat hack, hackneyed phenomenon of normal science. It is necessary to show that research under a paradigm must be a particularly effective way of uh, inducing paradigm change. But then how? If paradigms undergo change under the normal scientific tradition, when normal science does not question the existing paradigm, then how can paradigms undergo transformation? As pointed out earlier, okay, normal science purports to force nature in the conceptual boxes provided by the reigning paradigm or existing paradigm the dominant paradigm by solving puzzles in accordance with the rules and regulations and guidelines provided by the existing paradigm whose validity is accepted without question. And during this process of puzzle solving certain hurdles may be encountered because the because if the existing paradigm cannot solve the problems. Uh, through the guidelines of normal science, then, then, then certain hurdles, certain obstacles, certain hindrances may be encountered. We then speak of anomalies. What are these anomalies? What do we mean by anomalies? By anomalies, we mean unexpected or unanticipated occurrences or happenings. Okay? When we speak of anomalies, that is an anomaly arises when a puzzle remains puzzled defying every attempt to resolve it within the framework of the existing paradigm. Then puzzle does not get solved, then puzzle remains a puzzle, that is where we encounter certain problems within the normal scientific tradition. But appearance of one or two anomalies is not adequate to overthrow an existing paradigm. Because you may say that no, these are only the exceptional cases. But only through except only by uh, looking at exceptional cases, we do not in general overthrow a dominant paradigm, an existing paradigm. Okay? The ushering in of the era of a new paradigm has to be preceded by the appearances of not one or two anomalies, not many small anomalies, but major ones. In order to declare a paradigm to be crisis ridden, what is required is an accumulation of many, many, many major anomalies. These unexpected, unanticipated occurrences or happenings must be accumulated, must be major ones and they must be accumulated in such a manner to declare that a paradigm is crisis ridden. But there is no clear cut or objective criterion according to uh, Kuhn to decide which anomalies are major or which anomalies are minor and how many anomalies must be accumulated okay, to declare a paradigm to be crisis ridden. In other words, there is no criterion, there is no indicator, there is uh, no yardstick okay, which decides, which determines whether a perceived anomaly is a puzzle or the symptom of a deep crisis. We do not know. The issue will be decided by the community of practitioners of the discipline through the judgment of its peers. Therein lies the problem. I mean therein lies the beauty of beauty of Kuhnian methodological schema so far as the methods of science are concerned. Whether the existing paradigm is in crisis or not will come to know only through the consensus that the scientific community that the practitioners of the particular discipline that they bring in. That is why the issue will be the, the controversy, the, the, 
the debate okay that is why the issue will be decided by the community of practitioners of the discipline through the judgment of its peers. Once the scientific community declares the existing paradigm to be crisis ridden, the search for the alternative paradigm begins. Of course, the crisis ridden paradigm will not be given up until and unless a new theory is accepted in its place. I mean, the crisis ridden paradigm will continue to be there if we know until and unless we find a new paradigm in its place. And not simply we find a new paradigm, but it also has to be accepted by uh, the community of practitioners of the discipline through the judgment of its peers. Okay? It is only it is only during this transitional period of search for the new paradigm that the scientific deb debates become radical. When norm if within normal science you encounter anomalies and through these through the, the accumulation of major anomalies you come to know that no the existing paradigm is in crisis okay then and when the search for the transitional period of research for the new paradigm uh, uh, comes up then we encounter the kind of uh, the then we encounter the radical scientific debates okay not the norm bound scientific debates but rather tradition shattering uh, scientific debates. And during the process of the search for an alternative, the scientific uh, community must make a choice between competing theories. In this choice, the evaluation procedures of normal science are of no use, for these depend in part upon a particular paradigm and that paradigm is at issue. The issue concerning the paradigm choice cannot be settled by logic and experiment alone okay? because of the, the complexity of the, uh, the research problem. The issue concerning the paradigm choice, the, the issue concerning the selection of a particular paradigm cannot be uh, settled by logic and experiment alone. What ultimately matters? is the consensus of the relevant scientific community. In other words, the selection of a theory, the choice of a theory uh, as the new paradigm has to be understood in terms of the value judgments which a community of scientific practitioners exercises in the context in which it finds itself. Why, why Kuhn said uh, no, uh, the issue concerning uh, the choice of a paradigm cannot be settled by logic and experiment alone. Logic when I say, I mean scientific logic, logic in scientific discovery, experiment means, I mean it is a method, I mean they, they, these two are there, that is why from the very beginning I, we discussed the way, the methods which, which science deploys, okay? there they must be empirically confirmed and logically consistent statements of regularities. In this sense, the, the issue concerning the, the selection of a particular paradigm model cannot be settled by logic and experiment alone. Suppose let me give you an example, whether India should go ahead with nuclear tests or not, does it happen only on the basis of logic in scientific discovery and experiments in sciences? No. Whether India should go ahead with nuclear tests or not, is it simply a scientific question or a political question? Whether India should go ahead with nuclear tests, is it based on some scientific advices or is it based on the consensus that was forced with, between the scientific and political elites of the country? This is where value judgments come up. But as we have seen uh, during uh, uh, while, while discussing positivism the, in science, there must be a dichotomy between fact and value. Facts are value neutral, whereas values do not have factual content. But in this case, I mean 
the kind of scientific policies, the kind of scientific judgments that we make, the kind of scientific decisions that we make, okay, they have become a part of, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, the, they, they, the, the way uh, the, these such paradigms have emerged, they must be such emergence of such paradigms must be understood, okay, in terms of the value judgments which a community of uh, scientific practitioners exercises in the context in which it finds itself. That is why the con context is very important. Okay? That is why it may not be uh, determined through only logic and experiment. While choosing, a, while choosing a particular theory for the status of a new paradigm, okay, the scientific community might advance uh, arguments that seek to show that the chosen theory solves important problems is simpler than the rest and so on. Suppose, suppose let me tell you that while, while selecting a particular theory okay, for the status of a new paradigm, because the new paradigm has to replace the older one, old one. Okay. The, the, the scientific community might advance arguments that to that seek to show that the, the selected theory, the chosen theory solves important problems and it is also simpler than the rest and so on. But these are all value judgments since there is no objective criterion to decide which problem is uh, important, which problem is not important, which problem is significant, which problem is not significant, what is simple, what, what kind of method that is simple, what kind of method that is complex okay, and so on. In other words, that theory is chosen which fits the value commitments of a scientific community. Then it is not fact based, it is value based. Now, the transition has taken place from fact to a value just on the basis of consensus among the practitioners of the scientific community. Hence, the question of choice becomes the question of value. Okay? As we uh, have discussed, no observation is presuppositionless. Why? No, because any observation that we make okay, must involve some amount of selection. On the basis of what? Selection is based, what is the basis of selection? The selection is based on cultural relevance as Weber said it. If selection is, uh, is based on cultural relevance, then the question of choice or selection becomes the question of value. I mean it, it may not be a fact. And Kuhn points out that the question of value can be answered only in terms of criteria that lie outside the purview of normal science altogether. And it is that recourse to external criteria that most previously makes paradigm debates revolutionary. Okay. Now, the question that the, the question of uh, selection, the question of cultural relevance, the question of value that we talk about in the context of Kuhnian methodology of science, okay, then it is not based on certain uh, fact. It is also not based on value in simplistic sense, but value the way it has been organized, the way it has been interpreted by the practitioners of a particular discipline, I mean the scientific community in this sense. Thus, a, the selection of a paradigm cannot be explicated in the natural language of mathematical equations and experimental procedures, but in terms of specific perceptions which a scientific community as a social entity entertains what it considers to be the basic value of its professional expertise. In other words, the ultimate explanation of a theory choice, the ultimate explanation of the selection of a theory is not methodological, but sociological according to Kuhn. Hence, 
in Kuhn's scheme the idea of scientific community as a social entity is axiomatic. That is why whenever we make some kind of selection okay, of a paradigm in sciences even in sciences okay, it may not be based on fact it mostly it is based on value as has been envisaged by Kuhnian methodological account of science in the context of uh, the consensus which is forced by the practitioners of that particular discipline uh, while uh, making a judgment by the by the it is also determined the selection of a new paradigm is also determined in terms of uh, the peer group uh, that is why uh, these days you find many journals they have peer review system okay? uh, and uh, for Kuhn it is not simply I mean selection of a new theoretical paradigm it is not simply uh, methodological, but sociological. Okay? Perhaps for this reason Kuhn's, Kuhn's idea of scientific community as a social entity uh, is axiomatic. That is to say, if, if the term paradigm is to be successfully explicated, scientific communities must first be recognized as having an independent existence which implies that one must explain scientific practice in terms of paradigms and paradigmatic changes and the latter are to be explicated in terms of a particular scientific community which shares the paradigms and brings about paradigmatic changes, I mean changes in terms of a model. Thus, the concept of a scientific community is basic to the concept of paradigm. The concept of scientific community can be explicated only in sociological terms uh, according to Thomas Kuhn. Hence, the ultimate terms of explication of scientific activity are not methodological, but sociological. Then what is the relationship between the old paradigm which has been overthrown and the new paradigm which has been accepted? What is the relationship between uh, the old paradigm and the new paradigm and Kuhn's answer uh, to this question is extremely radical. According to Kuhn, in no obvious sense can one say that the new paradigm is better or truer than the old one. Kuhn maintains that the two successful paradigms uh, cut the world differently. They speak different languages, they use different idioms. Okay. Uh, putting it metaphorically, the world changes when a paradigm changes. The world changes when the paradigm changes. Our view of about astronomy changed when we saw the transition from Ptolemy's uh, uh, version to Copernican revolution and subsequently Galileo's uh, inventions. Okay? That is why our world views, our, uh, our perspective also changes when a paradigm makes changes. With Kuhn's characteristic lucidity, he says, I mean uh, the transition from a paradigm in crisis to a new one from which a new tradition of normal science can emerge is far from a cumulative process. One is achieved not merely by an articulation or extension of the old paradigm. Rather, it is a reconstruction of the field from new fundamentals, a reconstruction that changes some of the field's most elementary theoretical generalizations as well as many of its methods and applications. This apart Kuhn contains that the two paradigms talk different languages, idioms. Even if the same terms are used in two paradigms, the terms have different meanings. 
what can be said in the language of one paradigm cannot be translated into the other language. Based on this reason Kuhn claims that the relationship between the two successive paradigms is incommensurable. That is, an, there is something called incommensurability thesis. Okay? If I say secularism and communalism they are incommensurable. Okay? Why? Because they are opposed categories. That is why the old paradigm okay, and the new paradigm they are incommensurable. Ptolemy and Copernicus might have used the same language, same medium, same concepts. Newton and Einstein might have used the same language, idioms, concepts. They might have used, followed the same methods, but essentially, essentially they are incommensurable because, because, because the new, um, new paradigm, it, it makes an intellectual and political departure, a theoretical departure from the older one. Okay? In this sense, no wonder Kuhn compares paradigm shift to gestalt switch. With this idea, the idea of scientific progress as a continuous process and the idea of truth as the obstacle standard stand totally repudiated. I mean, I mean with this the idea of scientific progress as a continuous process and the idea of truth as the absolute standard stand totally rejected, repudiated, refu refuted. Kuhn advances what might appear to be an undiluted relativism according to which truth is intraparadigmatic and not interparadigmatic. That is to say, what is true is relative to a paradigm and there is no truth lying outside all paradigms. Okay? Then what we have, what have we discussed till now? I mean, in the methods of science, what we have discussed? We have discussed inductivism, hypothesism, uh, then uh, positivism, then Popper and Kuhn. Popper and Kuhn, they constitute the, the most dominant methods in the history, in the annals of history of science, okay? perhaps intellectually most stimulating controversies have emerged from these two intellectuals. Okay? In the context of Popper, the first step suggests, I mean, this, I mean according to Popper, science must start with a problem, it must suggest a hypothesis or in the form of a tentative solution to a problem or hunch, which uh, goes through the process of systematic falsification and such systematic falsification may uh, lead to refutation or corroboration. I mean, if a hypothesis is tested wrong, then we must refute this, we must reject this hypothesis, uh, but if it is, but if a hypothesis is tested right, then we must be able to corroborate it. We should not accept it because under what limiting conditions a particular hypothesis is tested right. Okay? Not all, not under all uh, limiting, I mean not under all circumstances such hypothesis, a uh, particular hypothesis is tested right. That is why we must be able to corroborate it, we must be able to keep our hypothesis permanently tentative. As against this, Kuhn suggested that every science passes through two stages, one the pre-paradigmatic stage and two the paradigmatic stage. Then what is the role of science? I mean, in the pre-paradigmatic stage, what we see in the that there is divergent thinking, you will find more than one mode of practicing that particular science, even in the case of astronomy, physics, chemistry and biology. And when there is a concept of convergent thinking, when that there is a scope of convergent thinking, then science becomes mature, science enters the paradigmatic stage from the pre-paradigmatic stage. 
when science makes a leap from pre paradigmatic stage to a paradigmatic stage science becomes mature ok. Within that is why uh, if I say there is a transition from pre paradigmatic stage to paradigmatic stage I mean there is a transition from from divergent thinking to convergent thinking there is a tran transition from plurality of practices to the uniformity of practice and astronomy was the first discipline which entered uh, the paradigmatic stage uh, by building uh, by by building such consensus by having that convergent thinking followed by physics chemistry and biology but in but according to kuhn in certain areas in creative areas like art literature music uh, philosophy and even medicine okay it is extremely uh, impossible i mean it is absolutely impossible to uh, make such transition from pre paradigmatic stage to paradigmatic stage because of the nature of the problems then in the paradigmatic stage we encounter i mean we that is we try to emphasize more on uh, sciences which are uh, guided by certain norms rules regulations of the existing paradigm that is why it is called normal science norm bound science and when normal science fails to uh, address the problems of unexpected or unanticipated occurrences or happenings uh, which uh, uh, Kuhn suggested that uh, when normal science uh, is encountered by certain anomalies I mean unanticipated or unexpected occurrences ok. Then that normal scientific tradition gets I mean becomes crisis ridden and the situation of crisis always forces us to uh, search for uh, uh, a new paradigm ok and that new paradigm is achieved ok uh, by rejecting the existing paradigm uh, by looking at the revolutionary science or scientific revolutions which is a tradition setting activity that is why uh, what Kuhn suggested that if normal science is the tradition bound activity then revolutionary science is the tradition shattering activity ok. This is this is very important. Now, from from this we are not going to directly jump to Farabend ok. We will first try to understand the comparisons between Popper and Kuhn. We, we have compared uh, we have we have discussed inductivism, hypothesism, pop, uh, positivism, popper and Kuhn. And then it is important make a comparison between popper and Kuhn and then we will move on to uh, Paul Farabend's against method uh, outline of an anarchistic methodology ok. We will see now some of the radical implications of Kuhn's position can be brought about by juxtaposing his views with those of Popper. The hallmark of science according to Popper is critical thinking as we have already discussed. In fact, science exemplifies critical thinking at its best. If you look at critical thinking, you can go back to what uh, uh, Descartes said I mean Cartesian philosophy of science suggests that cogito ergo sum I think therefore I am I, I doubt therefore I am. That is why for Popper in fact uh, science exemplifies critical thinking at its best. Since critical thinking considers nothing to be settled and lying beyond all doubt fundamental disagreements and divergent thinking must and in fact do characterize science. We have discussed Kuhn's uh, version of the shift from uh, pre paradigmatic stage to paradigmatic stage. That shift from pre paradigmatic stage to paradigmatic stage suggests the shift from plurality of practices to the uniformity of practice. I mean the such shift also indicates 
the shift from divergent thinking to convergent thinking. But, but for Popper, since critical thinking considers nothing to be settled and lying beyond all doubt, fundamental disagreements, no convergence, fundamental disagreements and divergent thinking must and indeed do characterize science. As we have seen according to Kuhn, what constitutes the essence of scientific practice is normal science, norm bound science. Science is guided by certain rules, regulations and so on and we have also seen why normal science is a highly tradition bound activity, a puzzle solving activity, an activity made possible by a consensus among the practitioners who share a particular paradigm. Thus, uh, if Popper sees the essence of science is divergent thinking and fundamental disagreements, Kuhn sees the essence of science in convergent thinking and consensus. To put it differently, the hallmark of science according to Kuhn is tradition bound thinking. In fact, according to Kuhn, what distinguishes science from the other areas of creative thinking is that whereas in science one finds institutional mechanisms of enforcing consensus, the other areas suffer from perpetual disagreements even on, even on fundamentals. This is the first one. Secondly, if Popper considers the individual to be the locus of scientific activity, Kuhn bestows that status upon the scientific community. If Popper considers the individual to be the locus of scientific activity, Kuhn bestows that status upon the collective, on the scientific community. Both positivists as well as Popper looked upon science as the sum total of the work of individual scientists working in accordance with a method. This is important. Though positivists and Popper also fundamentally differed on the characterization of that particular method. You see for, for, um, uh, uh, for what is that method? I mean uh, positivists uh, they always looked at that method. I mean starting point must be observation whereas for Popper it is always the identification of a problem. Okay? Observation uh, is theory laden for Popper, for, uh, uh, for positivists observation is theory independent. As opposed to this individualistic account of scientific enterprise, Kuhn propounds a collectivistic account of scientific activity. Okay? In Kuhn's scheme, it is the scientific community which constitutes the change. This is borne out by the fact that according to Kuhn, the scientific community has institutional mechanisms like peer review by which it can settle all the issues such as whether an anomaly is a symptom of crisis or it is merely an exception or how many anomalies suffice to uh, warrant the search for an alternative paradigm. What do, what do we mean by major anomalies or minor and minor ones? What factors are to be considered in choosing a new theory for the status of a new paradigm and so on? Thirdly, Popper and Kuhn differ fundamentally in their attitude towards the transition from one theory to another in science. According to Popper, we can explain every case of theory change in terms of certain norms which science always adopts and follows meticulously. In fact, scientific rationality consists in following these norms. But Kuhn contends that an adequate explanation of theory change must be in terms of the value judgments made by a community while making the choice. According to Kuhn, recourse to the so called methodological norms explains nothing. I mean, when Popper was absolutely um, uh, confident about the method of, uh, I mean methodological rationale of science, uh, uh, Kuhn moved beyond the methodological rationale to, to value commitments, to value judgments in terms of, uh, I mean in sociological terms. 
from the point of view the, from the point of view of popper okay kunijen irrationalist because he sets aside methodological norms and seeks to uh, explain uh, theory change exclusively in terms of non rational or sociological factors or like value commitments of a professional group or an or ideological commitments of a professional group okay oh, by the way what is an ideology uh, um, i mean uh, theoretically speaking uh, ideologies are myths ideologies are uh, fantasies ideologies are inverted images ideologies are echoes of material life this this characterization of ideology is very important uh, while discussing science because uh, because if science has to be objective then it also has to uh, be devoid of any kind of ideology okay in the in the popperian schema but but in the kunian schema i mean uh, 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 for popper science cannot uh, have value judgments value commitments it has to, it must em employ uh, strong methods okay for, for it cannot be ideologically oriented that's why i said what are ideologies ideologies are myths ideologies are fantasies ideologies are uh, inverted images ideologies are echoes of material life in quest of truth in quest of knowledge one must purge upon his or her ideology i mean uh, Uh, in quest of truth in quest of knowledge one must go beyond his or her ideology okay in this sense what we are trying to do that what popper tried to do that popper tried to provide a strong methodological rational uh, or strong methodological explanation within the purview of science what kuhn suggests that very often scientific decisions are made not simply on the basis of logic and experiments but on the basis of value judgments of the practitioners of a particular discipline through peer review okay whatever be the merit of but 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 such such sociological account uh, of theory change was attacked by Uh, popper popper said uh, kuhn is an irrationalist uh, because he sets aside methodological norms and seeks to explain theory change exclusively in terms of non rational or sociological factors like value commitments of a professional group whatever be the merit of popper's attack on kuhn as an irrationalist we can say that okay we can uh, we can say that popper's attack on kuhn uh, i mean uh, we can say that kuhn's construal of scientific practice is sociological that is to say according to kuhn uh, scientific activity cannot be understood by trying to find out the absolute standards which have guided the scientific activity in all ages it can only be understood in terms of the specific judgments which a community makes at a particular juncture regarding what it considers to be its value commitments as a professional group the the juxtaposition between popper and kuhn brings out the radical implications of kuhn's views regarding the nature of scientific practice however in one respect kuhn is very close to popper both like posit both popper and kuhn like positivists contend that there is something unique to science though they differ in their explanation of what that uniqueness consists in positivists maintain that the hallmark of science is the systematic verifiability of its claims according to popper the uniqueness of science consists in the systematic falsifiability of theories according to kuhn it is consensus which marks out uh science from uh, the other areas of human endeavor i mean when positivists suggested that the science that that science must start with observation okay the the hallmark of science uh lies in the fact that 
all scientific statements must be systematically verifiable. Popper said that uh, it is not systematic verifiability rather yeah, it is systematic falsifiability. How is science unique? How is science supreme? How, how the, we must demarc make a demarcation between some science and non-science? The uniqueness of science according to Popper consists in the systematic falsifiability of theories. For Kuhn, it is consensus which marks out science from the other areas of human endeavor. That is to say, Kuhn like positivists and Popper does not question whether science is really unique or not. He Kuhn assumes that to be so. Kuhn only wants to show how it is unique. Okay? That is to say, instead of raising critical questions about the status of science, about the status science has acquired in the contemporary culture, Kuhn only seeks to provide an alternative account of how it has acquired that status. In that sense, Kuhn's position is quite conservative. Okay? And this con conservative character okay, of Kuhn's views uh, becomes evident when we look at the views of Paul Farabend, uh, whose iconoclast ideas about science have made him a legend in his own lifetime. I mean, Farabend's against method uh, outline of an anarchistic uh, methodology mm. uh, or an anarchistic outline of an anarchistic theory of knowledge yeah, uh, in 1975. Okay? Now, let us see to, till now what we have done? We have tried to delineate the methods of science in terms of inductivism, hypothesism, positivism, the methods propounded by two eminent historians and philosophers of science namely uh, Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn. Now, we will go ahead with uh, Paul Farabent whose views about the very idea of scientific method okay, uh, uh, require greater attention. I mean the way uh, Farabent uh, repudiates the very idea of scientific method, uh, not simply on the basis of uh, value judgments, I mean uh, not simply on the basis of um, uh, whims, but but on the basis of logic and history. Okay? Uh, we will see it now. <laughs> <laughs>